folks, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. All right, it's another week, last week of January. This is the last week of the Dice Tower Kickstarter, so if you were thinking about supporting the show, well, don't wait too long. So you can find a link on our website, Dice Tower, or in the comments below this. Um, and I really appreciate everybody who's been involved with that. I'm looking forward to coming this coming year. Now, on a Dice Tower front, Things may get hairy over the next three or four weeks as with our production schedules. I think this week we'll have a regular full production schedule. Next week, however, on the 5th, my baby is due. Uh, so probably won't see as much from me that week. And then uh, a week and a half later, I'll be moving to a new location here in Homestead, a bigger house, well, a bigger room, hopefully a, a better, better lighting and everything for this room here. So some interesting things, and I'm gonna actually try to document part of that move for you guys as we do it, so you can see what it's like to move a game room. Um, doesn't sound incredibly fun, but hopefully when we're done, the whole thing will look good. So, anyhow, um, that's what's coming up from the Dice Tower. Let's get to the news. It's time for the news. First of all, I may have missed this one. Ignacy Trebizek, uh, who is the designer of Robinson Crusoe, runs Portal Games, very well-respected designer, has, is working with Fantasy Flight to bring out The Witcher, the board game. The Witcher, based on a very popular license. Uh, this board game uh, looks to be a big, grandiose, adventure-style game where you go in and you're... Um, I, I, lots of pieces, the kind of thing Fantasy F Flight is well-known for. Very much looking for this one when it comes out. Uh, Will Wheaton got together with Days of Wonder this past week and announced Tabletop Day. Tabletop Day is a day where you get together and encourage other people to get together to play games. This year it's going to be on April 5th. Last year was pretty big. This year they expect to be pretty bigger. Um, it's going to be all over the world and there's probably a location near you. If you happen to live in Southern Florida, then come on out and join us at the uh, Hollywood location of Cool Stuff. Asthma Day is going to be reprinting one of the popular games from Essen, Lewis and Clark. That's supposed to come out in March-ish area. Patch History, which was a Korean game uh, about patching uh, together your land and great wonders of the world and leaders. It's a very good civilization building game. I like it, um, but it really needed to be republished and redone in English. I was curious what publisher picked it up, and apparently it's a publisher called Stunt Kite Publishing. I know nothing about them. This is apparently their very first game, kind of a, out of the blue. I'm hoping they do a great job, but again, uh, we're going to have to wait and see on that one. AEG has decided to release another version of Love Letter because why not? Uh, this one's set in the, the L5R universe. Again, no surprise there. Now, they did announce another deck building game, Valley of the Kings. Valley of the Kings is an Egyptian themed deck building game. It was only a matter of time because Egyptian themes will creep into every single board game genre there is. But I went and looked at it. It looks like you build little pyramids uh, with, the, with the cards and stuff. Who knows? Uh, certainly sounds interesting. They announced a new expansion from Fantasy Flight for Relic. Uh, this one's called Nemesis, where you can fight each other and be bad guys. Good job. And Assassin's Creed, the board arena, it's called the board game, from uh, Cryptozoic will be coming out in February. So Cryptozoic's games have been, in my opinion, slightly getting better as time goes by. So this is certainly one to look forward to. And another game that Z-Man got when I got the Hans and Gluck stable uh, with Carcassonne and the things like that, they now are going to be reprinting Vikings, which is a fun Euro game. And you should check that out coming soon. talk about some games that you should see hit cool stuff this week uh, of course don't hold me to these because logistics and things this might not happen but here's what you should see devastation of indines from level 99 finally i raved about this game last year hit my top 10 games of all time and now you can play this fantastic uh two player or more fighting style game upon a fable you know i did a preview of upon a fable last year it's a kind of an agricola light style game where you're building a story very interesting um the pieces were really good in the prototype very eager to see what they're going to look like in the final version uh duke expansion coming out robin hood just played this one this past week really like the expansions for the duke also some expansions for eminent domain and belfort i know that they have gone out to kickstarter backers so those expansions will be out zombie dice deluxe all right cool 
And Ultimate One Night Werewolf, which is a game, another game that I've been raving about. So some good stuff we're going to kind of see coming this week. But enough talk about new stuff. Let's go back and look at an older game. Fireball Island is a race against your friends in which you are trying to steal a jewel, which, inconveniently, is placed near Volcar, the island's horrific idol. The game mechanics are quite simple. You roll a die, then you move that many spaces. If you land on any of these darker spots on the trail, you may draw a card. These cards are crucial, and they have a variety of actions. They may help you out, or hinder your opponent, and knowing when to use them is equally as crucial. If when rolling you roll a 1, then it's fireball time! Instead of moving, you must push one of the fireballs towards a target, even if that were to include yourself. Getting hit by a fireball probably never ends well for you. Your pawn moves to the corresponding smoldering pit, you lose a turn, and you drop the jewel, if you had it. Speaking of the jewel, the first player that gets to Volcar takes the jewel, draws up to 4 cards, pushes a fireball, and then takes three turns back to back. Oh my. Now that player must escape to the dock with every player probably chasing after them. From this point it becomes even more tense as you try to get caught up with them. You may want to turn in your magic charm to get some cards, or try your luck at one of the caves. If you pass that player, you steal the jewel, but be careful, they might steal it right back as they pass you. The first player to the boat with the jewel wins the game. Overall, this game is just awesome. <laughs> there is so much fun packed into this giant box. For as simple as it is, this game creates a very fun, enjoyable experience. What came out from Cool Stuff this past week? Uh, expansion for Tokaido, Tokaido Crossroads. Uh, Quantum, a fun little dice game. Uh, if you go to watch it played, Rodney Smith is currently showing how to play this game. I, I would like to get this one for a review myself. Rumble in the Dungeon and Rumble in the House are now, you can get a hold of both of those. There's actually one of the things in our Kickstarter is a little custom expansion for those, but they're really fun little games where you try to knock everybody out. It's really quick, small games. Um, the Ship Pack for Eclipse, Roads and Boats, the reprint is finally out, along with his expansion called Roads and Boats, etc. Uh, the Small World six-player map is out. Hopefully I'll have a review of that up this week. Uh, the reprint of Ricochet Robots and the Z-Man version of the two-player game, Babel. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Board Game Geek just named Agricola the iOS Game of the Year for 2013, so what better time to take a quick look at this universal app developed by Playdeck? Farming is tough, especially in the 17th century. In Uwe Rosenberg's classic Agricola, you must manage all elements of your homestead, from improving your home, to having children, to growing crops and raising livestock, and of course, don't forget to feed your family. A seminal Euro game, Agricola is a complex game full of bits and tiles and cards, Porting it to a mobile platform had to be a daunting task, but no better developer than Playdeck to do it. The game is fully realized, and it offers everything you'd want in a board game app, including AI, online play, interactive tutorials, achievements, and four different offline gameplay modes. And Playdeck really took the farm and village theme to heart, adding ambient animations throughout, bringing the board game to life with beautiful graphics. Of course, the implementation of Agricola is one of the more divisive board-to-app transitions around. Some players love the atmospheric village look and the streamlined labeling choices. Others were really frustrated with the disconnect between the physical game they had grown used to and the app version. In a nod to experienced players, the app offers tutorial focused solely on the app interface, trying to help players connect the physical elements to their app counterparts. The app sells for $6.99 and has two in-app expansions right now, the I and the K Dex, for $1.99 each. It has gone on sale a few times for as low as $4.99. How you feel about Agricola on iOS will likely largely depend on how you feel about the implementation choices made to bring the game into the mobile world. However, I think everyone should agree that Agricola on iOS is a gorgeous game with incredible attention to detail that does its very best to distill a complex strategy game into a device-friendly experience. Give it a try! <music> 
this is actually the last of these that I'm going to be doing for a while because I'm moving soon and my shelves are going to be completely changed around and I'm not going to remember which shelves I've gone over and which I haven't. So here is my biggest shelf. I found this shelf one time um, on the side of a road in Korea and it was a, it's a great bookshelf and I'm going to try to keep it because I like the shelf so much. But I have all my card games here stacked up and I can't go over every single one of these. Over here you see a pile of Player Entertainment and Game Right games. Actually, I think these are all, yeah, there's a mix of both of them. These are great kids games. I like them quite a bit. And then here you see card games that I've kept. Uh, Grimoire from Z-Man Games. Uh, this one, which is a, oh yeah, that's this is that uh, really great Machu Picchu game. Uh, Dos de Mayo, a fun two-player game, uh, almost like a light area control slash war game. The four Griffin games that I like the best are here. One Night Ultimate Werewolf, Gangster. This is uh, Mogul, a game I love to see re be reprinted at some point. David and Goliath, best trick-taking game. My Werewolf collection with Ultimate Werewolf, Werewolf Inquisition. Uh, down here is Guillotine from Wizards of the Coast. Dungeon Guilds, I just reviewed that last week. Hanabi, Dweebies, Havoc. This is a really cool game that um, is out of print at this point in time. Uh, Jaipur, good two-player game. Death Angel, fun cooperative game. Another one, uh, Shadows Over Camelot. Both of those uh, fun, like, card versions of their larger counterparts. Hawken, I enjoy that uh, two-player mech game. The Bottle Imp, a great trick-taking game. Cloud Nine, we played that in a live uh, show. Very fun. Escape. These are just like super fun games. Fist of Dragonstones, the sequel to Citadels in a sense. Uh, Divinair, a fun game that I enjoy thinking and trying to outthink other people. Dragon's Gold, a great negotiation game. Bang the Dice game, a faster, cooler version of Bang. Coyote, um, The Resistance, uh, and I have both Resistance in here, both Resistance and Resistance Avalon. Sleuth, very thinky game, but one I enjoy a lot. Nobody But Us Chickens, which is an entertaining game. And uh, the trick-taking game Dwarf King. So that's a lot of games really on one shelf. When, um, when I'm counting my games up and I get to this shelf, I'm like, oh man, because I'm going to have to add a pile. And I'm talking about games in the Academy. So welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower. And so this time I'm going to be talking about a topic that I discuss in my Designing Serious Games class, and that's about games that aren't fair. We look at games in our recreational board game space, and we try to make sure those games are fair. And if the game isn't fair, well, then it may not be fun to play. Um, and this is a situation that, that if a designer makes something that isn't fair in a game, it's going to upset some players. Or it may make an area of the game or strategy of the game something people just don't even venture down because they don't feel it's fair. Uh, could be a bad risk versus reward decision or something that just helps one player. Some people look at the snowball effect in some games where someone does better and does better and does better that, that they feel that's not fair. And so having a fair situation in a game is something that a lot of recreational board gamers look to. It's not always the case in war gaming, though. If you think about war games, sometimes in war games that are not out of the recreational board game space, they are instead trying to replicate a historical situation. And there are many historical situations that aren't fair. And that's okay, because what they'll do is, is they'll set up the game this way, and they know that it's going to be very, very difficult for one player to win because the odds were stacked against them. But that's the challenge that some of these gamers want to take on, to see can they beat the odds, can they make it through in an unfair situation. Now, in serious games, there are other times that you might make something that is not fair. Anytime you want to represent different levels of power that you want to try, because in a serious game, you're usually trying to mon map some real-world situation into a game-based space, and most real-world situations aren't fair. And you can use the game to help teach about the fact that it's not fair. If you think about classes and wealth distribution, you know, a wealth distribution is not fair. And if you want to make a game that helps people explore that, well then it has to be not fair. And in fact, part of playing that game helps you see why it's not fair. A game that isn't fair, where you take on a role in society that's different than your own, helps you to understand why you have an advantage or why you have a disadvantage in situations, because it can help you to take a closer look at the system. Uh, so one example, I had a, a friend who was telling me about a teaching class that he wanted to teach about the different uh, powers in the world. And so one 
group had all the resources and another group had lots of people but very few resources and they all were trying to accomplish the same goals and the group with all the resources realized that what they could do is offer some of the resources in exchange for people from the team that had lots of people but very few resources and so they could try and get some help that way so both teams could win but it created these unfair situations so it's interesting when you think about that and you say what are some situations in board games where we would make something unfair one might be when you want a handicapping system. Go, for example, has a handicapping system, which it needs to, because if two players are different skill levels, it won't be a very interesting game for either one. But so next time you say, well, this game isn't fair, stop and think, hmm, maybe he meant it that way. Take care, and I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye. I know I said I was going to try to get 20 reviews out last week. I only got out 18, for which I do apologize. But this week, I'll try to get, I'm not going to give you a number, but I'll try to get out several more. Uh, we're going to see a lot of smaller independent publishers looked at, although I will be taking a look at Theseus finally. I had wanted to get some more plays of that before I put it out. And K2, which is a game that I, I probably should have reviewed a long time ago. But getting to that one. Uh, on the Dice Tower Network, if you go to Dice Tower Network, you'll see that we have added a new podcast, Start Space. This is a great podcast if, to listen to people who are just getting into the hobby and they're kind of explaining what it's like as they get into the hobby at the very first and looking at all these games with fresh eyes. Very much enjoy that. You can find lots of podcasts at DiceTowerNetwork.com, including uh, our own podcast. And this, this week we'll be talking about the best games from... Uh, 2004, 10 years ago, a great year in gaming, and of course, many other good podcasts have come out at that point too. Hi everyone, I'm Boris Kiriki. Today, I introduce you to Jinkopolis, a Belgian game. We are in 2212, and cities are now built with trees and leaves. Each player is an architect who tries to get the most victory points by building the city of Ginkopolis. It's a drafting game, so on each turn you get an handful of cards, everybody picks one and reveals it when the others are ready. You can either use a building's power, every color has a different one, add a new building to the city, which lets you use powers of adjacent tiles, or construct above all buildings getting a new permanent asset. You gain more and more of these assets, which gives a cool combo flavor to the game. At the end of the game, the city will be huge, like this for example, and the districts where you have a majority will give you victory points. Ginkopolis is a fabulous city building game, which plays quickly thanks to its drafting mechanic. The special powers combination make it really fun to play also. At first, you'll be a bit lost. But within a few turns, you'll catch what are your possibilities and enjoy to construct above other players' buildings to cut off their majority. Certainly a great game to check out, Jinkopolis. Hello Chats and Chats, I just want to talk to you quickly about this game called uh, Forbidden Desert. It's quite a very good game. It's a lot better than Matt Leacock's other game, that Pan Schmimic thingy. But there's something about it which is not quite right. You can lose the game in three different ways. One of the ways is when the sandstorm level reaches this, which is pretty self-explanatory. You know, the storm is too strong and everybody dies. You can also lose the game if there are no more sand tiles to put out onto the board, which again makes sense. You know, there's, the, the storm is getting too strong and everyone says you're fighting a losing battle. And you can also lose the game if one of your characters uh, kind of runs out of water and dies of thirst. So let me get this right. You're playing with five players, you're all in the desert and one of you dies of thirst. And then all the other four just drop dead. Are they, like, connected telepathically? Is there, like, some kind of thirst Darth Vader going like that? Ah, Can you imagine a TV series that was like that? Can you imagine, say, for Lost, if one of the main characters died, and then all the main characters died? That wouldn't make sense, would it? But then again, the show would be a bit shorter. You know, it kind of makes me sad, you know, to think that maybe if Spock died in Star Trek 2, there would be no Star Trek 3, 4, 5, because all the rest of them would have died. 
So it's only a little tiny minus duty kind of niggle that I'm having. Otherwise the game is fantastic. But there is something else that is missing. It's not quite right from this box. Being a tin, you'd expect to find some chocolate in there. This past week I've had a chance to look at a lot of small game reviews, or games from small publishers. Uh, I've had a lot, chance to look at a lot of them, and that is one of the blessings and curses of being a board game reviewer, is that you get these smaller games, and many times they don't look that spectacular, sometimes they look downright bad. And you play these games and occasionally, and this is a very exciting thing and something I love, is finding one of these small games that's amazing and super fun and is like this diamond in the rough. And that's a great feeling and it's a wonderful thing. Um, that's tempered then, of course, by the fact that many times these games that look small and pathetic and bad often are mediocre at best or maybe they even worse than that. They're really bad games. And it's mind-boggling to me that there are people out there who make games and yet they kind of don't seem to me to put any research into it. Now, I don't think the internet is the end-all be-all, but we live in an age where we have information at our fingertips. And I know a lot about board games, but I don't know a lot about fishing. Um, I, I mean, I fished a little bit as a kid, but I'm not somebody who's really big into fishing. Of course, here in South Florida, fishing is a really big deal. So if I was going to go deep sea fishing down in Key Largo, for example, I would go and I would research it and I would at least talk to the people uh, in my church and other people I have contact with who know something about fishing. I wouldn't just say, I'm just going to go do what I can do. I might get lucky, but likely I would do very poorly because it's something I don't know about. And I am mind boggled at the people that I go to uh, when I go to conventions sometimes. I'll see these people selling a board game and I'll say, I'm Tom Vassell. And they'll say, I've never heard of you. Well, that's perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't expect people to have heard of me. But I do, when I, I'll say, okay, why? Well, I've written reviews. Maybe you've seen them on Board Game Geek. And they'll say, well, what's Board Game Geek? And I'm scratching my head trying to think of something on the internet that they may have seen and then come to find out they barely go on the internet for research at all. And I just want to facepalm there, you know, come on, folks. If you're going to produce a board game, put some research into it. Find out about www.bgdf, boardgamedesignforum.com, or Game Crafter, where they get together, or Board Game Geek and these other websites. Learn about the thing. Play other games. I mean, I've talked to these people and say, oh, we, have you heard of Settlers of Catan? And they say... No, I've never played that game. And Ah, oh, come on! You know, here they are making the next Monopoly ripoff or some trivia game or some really poor game. And I... Uh, uh, okay, but this rant would be kind of pointless because those people are not watching this video either. Um, and fortunately, Kickstarter has kind of alleviated the process because many of these people put their idea up in Kickstarter and it doesn't get backed. Um, and, you know, at least they're not mortgaging their houses as much anymore, but it still happens. But the reason I said it's not this video is not for them. The video is for the people watching this because if you are someone who likes board games, it becomes pretty obvious. People will see your sickness when they come to your house and see your, I'm sure you don't, most of you don't have a wall of games, but you have a shelf of games and people say, how can you have more than five games? And you talk to them about board games. People know you like board games. So your friend will likely come to you. He'll say, hey, I've made a new board game. It's really fun. I'm going to produce it. And I think that as a good friend, if you look at his board game and you find it lacking, it is your responsibility to tell him so. I think you are a poor friend if you let him mortgage his house and make 5,000 copies because they're not going to sell like gangbusters. Uh, games these days, the competition is, is really fierce out there. It really is. I've, made a, I, I've designed a game, nothing personal, which I think is a good game. I like it quite a bit. I, I think that other people like it and I see its sales and they're not blowing the roofs off. And had I produced that game on my own and would be trying to live off the production of that game, I would be in serious straits. And, um, uh, and that's a game that I would consider to be done by someone who's a little bit more informed about the gaming business. If you don't know what you're doing and you have 5,000 copies and you have your mom who loves the game, that doesn't mean it's going to sell. And so I'm not saying to grab the game from their hands and throw it into a fire, you know, pour kerosene over it, you know, get out of here, never touch games again, and be mean and, and cruel towards that person, but we got to be honest with our friends. 
If your friend came to you and said, I'm going to date somebody, I'm going to marry this person, and you thought that person was a really bad match for your friend, you would tell them, don't do it. I, I would hope so. Friends should be honest with one another. And I think we should be honest here, but honest with constructive advice. Say, okay, this is a great idea that you have here. Making a board game is, is a good idea. Have you checked out BGDF.com? Have you gone to Board Game Geek? Have you gone to Game Crafter? Have you done this? Here, here's some of my games. Let's play them. And so you can get these ideas flowing to help people, to, to push them to where they can do great things. There are so many times I get games and I, I get so frustrated and it's possible you'll see one of those frustrated reviews this week because I look at the game and I say, what were they thinking? How did they think that any of this worked? Did they play this with anybody? And the only thing I think of is that they played it with some people who really liked it and if they played it with any board gamers, then those board gamers lied to them and said, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, no, if it's not cool, let's tell people. And I don't think we should be harsh or mean or disrespectful to other people, but I think there's respectful ways to say, Okay, there's a lot of problems here. This, I don't think this will sell very well. And honesty sometimes will make people not like you. It really will, and it's, and it's an unfortunate thing. But I think it would help those people out a lot. I'm not so concerned about the board game business. You know, a little guy comes, makes a board game, and it doesn't sell well at all, and he crashes and burns. The board game, board games will go on. But I feel bad for that guy. And I don't like to see people crash and burn. I like to see people succeed. I like to see people do better. And I think knowledge is an excellent way to do that. So I think that, and I just, I just recently had somebody who I know from way outside board game circles and they were talking to me about a game and I thought, okay. And it, and it seemed like it was a very uh, strong ripoff of another uh, game that's been out for well, thousands of years. Um, and I, and I kind of pointed that out and said, well, here's some sites that you can see and go to. You know, they weren't really pleased. They were hoping that I was going to say, this is awesome, like many other people had said. But I felt that it was it was better for me to be honest. And I hated that because, you know, it can affect how, you know, they, they, they feel almost betrayed. But I think that you are doing them a better service in the long run. Arkham Horror, Twilight Struggle, Tenet. These are great games, but let's face it, they take up a lot of square footage not only on your shelves, but also on your gaming table when you finally get them open. Maybe you're traveling. Maybe you've only got a small budget for games. Or maybe you've got a small apartment and not a lot of room to keep those giant games on the shelves. Whatever your situation, micro games have got you covered. We've talked about some micro games in earlier videos. Things like Coup, Win, Lose, Banana, 8 Minute Empire. But now we're going to talk about some more. What? What's going on? I'm... I didn't sign up for this! IOTA is the new game from GameRight Games and designer Gene Mackles. This little tin packs a big, big game. It plays like a combination of Set and Spiel des Jahres winner Quirkle. Players score points by playing cards in a line where the criteria on each card in the line must all be either the same or different. Just two plays of IOTA and it earned a place in my travel bag. No Thanks by designer Thorsten Gimler and publishing house Z-Man Games is a great little anti-bidding game. Players use chips to not take cards that they don't want. Cards are worth points. You earn the points every time you collect a card. And just like golf, you want to have as few points as possible. This is another one that fits in my travel bag everywhere I go. Seiji Kanai's Love Letter is another tiny little awesome game. 16 cards, bunch of cubes, and BAM! You've got a great little game on your hands. Players are trying to get their love letter into the hands of this lovely young princess. Hi there. There's card counting, there's bluffing, there's reading your opponents. All of this drives the energy of Love Letter. A fantastic little game. Dungeon Roll by Chris Darden is a dungeon crawling, push your luck dice game where players take turns delving into a dungeon, trying to kill monsters, collect treasure, and make it out alive. The player who comes out with the most experience points and treasure after three turns wins the game. At three turns, Dungeon Roll never outstays its welcome at the table. Well, that's all the time we've got for micro games. Now, how the heck do I get big again? <laughs> That 
sucked. Not concise at all. Cut, cut, cut. Hey, and that's it for this week, folks. Like I said, Kickstarter's ending in uh, four or five days, so uh, last chance to go check that out. Also, if you want Mage Wars cards, uh, you can go to our website and you can uh, PayPal us if you want to get some of the new promo packs that just came out. But you know what, folks? I'm just really glad you guys keep watching this show. These board game breakfasts are doing well. Uh, very few pieces are destroyed in them. And I'm very much... You know what, guys? I, I need to get going here. I'm, I'm really excited. I have a baby coming in a, in nine days. Nine days. I have a, a house that I'm moving in uh, 20 days. It's going to be it's gonna be an interesting month. But the content will keep coming as much as I possibly can. And we have a host of other contributors who are also posting stuff on the Dice Tower. See you this week. To find out more about all of our podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. To see a listing of our videos, head to Dicetower.com. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in Stock.